This morning, we're going into our second part on our series of the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are found in the early part of Christ's Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. And these are the attitudes that God desires for us to have. Each of these attitudes have a blessing attached. They have an Old Testament anticipation. And they also have a New Testament guide to help us develop those attitudes as God wants us to develop them. Last week, we began looking at these and we looked at being poor in spirit. Which means not, having, not being poor in our relationship with God, but being humble before God. When we humble ourselves before God, then we're blessed with the kingdom of heaven. We also looked at those who mourn. When we mourn for our sins, we have an attitude of repentance. When we mourn, we're blessed by being comforted. And when, last week, we, last, we looked at those who are meek. Meekness is not weakness. But it's an understanding that we're nothing without God. When we have a meek attitude, we understand that the only power that we have is the power that we have through Jesus Christ. Amen. With a meek attitude, we are blessed by inheriting the earth. This morning, we're going to look at a few more of these Beatitudes. Our attitudes show what's important to us. When we have a positive attitude towards something or someone, then we're most likely to enjoy participating in that whatever that activity is or spending time around the people that we have a positive attitude toward. However, if we have a negative attitude, then we will do whatever is in our power to avoid those people or those activities. And Jesus, in this Sermon on the Mount, told us about the attitudes that He expected for those who follow Him to have. See, our attitudes can lead someone to Christ, but they can also lead someone away from Christ. Think about that for a minute. Do you want your attitude to lead somebody to Christ? Or do you want your attitude to push somebody away from Christ? This is particularly important when you have somebody that's Right there on the edge. They can go either way. This isn't part of my notes, but I read on Facebook this week where uh, somebody was insulted by somebody who was a member uh, of one of our Christian Motorcyclist Associ Association chapters. Uh, they, I don't know the details of it, but they were greatly offended by a member. Because of that one member's attitude, they have decided that they no longer want to be part of not just the CMA ministry, but ministry whatsoever. Because of the attitude of one person. Now, thankfully, there were a lot of other people that commented on this person's Facebook post that they don't need to hold it against that one person, that they need to pray for them. But the attitude of one person can push somebody completely away from Jesus Christ. So we need to be careful with our attitudes. So this morning as we get back into looking at the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, we read, Blessed, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You see, God and everything that comes from God is righteous. Have you ever had the desire to have something so bad that you can taste it or you can even feel it. Let's say, for example, you're really wanting a new car. You don't necessarily need one, but you really want one. Maybe there's a car that you had when you were younger or a car that maybe one of your friends had when you were younger that you would just love to have that car. Uh, for me, it would be a 64 and a half Mustang convertible. So if you have one, <laughs> You know where you can get rid of it. But you know, everybody, at one point or another, we run across maybe a dream car. I would also like to have a 69 Dodge Charger. You know, just throwing hints out there for everybody. But 
you, you really have longed for this car since your childhood. You know, maybe, you know, for me, the 69 Charger was the car of the Deuce of Hazard. That's why I love that car so much. It was something that I grew up with. But because of your desire to have this car, you're willing to do whatever it takes to get it. You're willing to work extra hours or maybe give up a hobby that you enjoy. Maybe you go out to eat less often. Or in the case of us, you don't go out to eat at all. Maybe you don't take a vacation for a year or two. You do whatever it takes so that you're able to afford this car. Now, this example is an example that the world can relate to. Because this is the type of thing that the world goes after. See, the world pursues personal needs, wants, and goals. Christ, however, instructs us that we are to hunger and thirst after righteousness. We are to hunger and thirst for God. We are to hunger and thirst to deepen our relationship with Jesus Christ. We are to seek justice and holiness for our lives, for the lives of our family and the lives of our friends and even our nation. When we have an attitude of hunger and thirsting for righteousness, we're seeking holiness. Psalm chapter 71 verse 2 says, In your righteousness rescue me and deliver me. Turn your ear to me and save me. <coughs> See, the psalmist here is crying out to God, knowing and understanding that it is only through God's righteousness <coughs> that we can be saved. It is only through a relationship with Jesus Christ, our Savior, that we can be made righteous. Philippians chapter 3 verse 9 says, And to be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. A righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. See, we cannot have justice or righteousness without faith in Christ. We can do the best that we can do to follow God's law, but we will fail. It doesn't matter how good of a person we are. Nothing that we do can make us righteous before God. See, when we per pursue our personal needs and wants and desires, we're not looking for righteousness. Now, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with working hard to get something that we need, or maybe even something that we want. But what I am saying is that we have to have the attitude that Christ is calling His people to have. We must have a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. When we have this hunger and thirst for righteousness, we understand that it only comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we must do whatever is necessary in order to strengthen our relationship with Him. We must be willing to read and study the Word of God. We must be willing to get on our knees and pray, seeking Christ in our lives. We must be willing to work hard on developing the attitudes that Christ calls for us to have. We must be willing to sacrifice for Christ. We may sacrifice our time, our money, our possessions, our careers, our goals, and our dreams in order to do what God has called us to do. An example from my life, when I graduated high school 20 years ago this June, I had all aspirations of going to Arkansas State University and graduating with a biology degree. And then going to Florida State and getting a marine biology master's and doctorate. I had everything lined up. I even had the scholarships and everything with Florida State lined up. And I hadn't even started at ASU. I had everything lined up. About two years into it, things went wrong. I didn't get to follow that path. I got steered off of that path. So I left school for a while and I started a family and then I went back to school 
on a completely different path. I went for public relations. I thought, hey, when I left there, we moved to Little Rock. I had a guaranteed job in Little Rock. Well, that didn't happen either. See, God was steering me down these certain paths in order to prepare me for where I'm at now. This was not my career goal. Trust me, this was not my career goal. But I'm here, and I'm happy to be here. And I feel blessed by being here. See, we must first seek with a hunger and thirst after His righteousness. Even if it causes us, causes us to sacrifice our own hopes and dreams. We must desire to deepen our relationship with Him. So when we hunger and we thirst after God, we're blessed by having that hunger and that thirst fulfilled. See, God will not only give us what we need and sometimes what we want, but He will also give us His justice and His righteousness. See, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, so that we can when we hunger and thirst after His righteousness, that it is available to us through our faith in Christ. We are filled when we hunger and we thirst for God. The next attitude that Christ talked about is Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Mercy is helping those who are less fortunate than ourselves. Mercy is offering forgiveness to others, even if they don't deserve it. Mercy is being compassionate to others. Mercy is a willingness to fix a wrong and a desire to relieve a suffering. Jesus, in the story of the Good Samaritan that you find in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, Go and, and read it sometime this week as you study through your outline. And he tells the story of a man who was beaten and who's left for dead. A Levite and a priest walk by, and they even go so far as to crossing to the other side of the street to avoid helping this man. But then a Samaritan, an outcast to the Jewish people, comes by. And he had mercy on the injured man and was willing to help even to sacrificing and paying the expense of the man until he healed from his wounds. See, this Samaritan was compassionate. He was giving. He was helpful. He was forgiving. He was willing to right a wrong and even help ease the pain of the man that the man was suffering. Now, the world that we live in fits into the idea of the Levite and the priest. <coughs> Those in the world are only out for themselves. It doesn't matter who they hurt to get what they want. It doesn't matter to the world what other people need. The people of the world desire power, and they don't care who gets hurt while they work to get it. They have no feelings towards other people. They have no compassion towards other people. But the Samaritan that Jesus talked about has the attitude that he desires for us to have. We are to help those in need. This is the attitude that Christ calls not just individuals, but his church to have towards others. See, we cannot ignore the needs of others. We cannot ignore those who are hurting especially right here in our little community. See, if we are the body of Christ, if we are the hands and feet of Christ, then we are to show mercy to those who need mercy. Psalm chapter 41, verse 1 says, Blessed is he who has regard for the weak. The Lord delivers him in times of trouble. See, in this passage, the psalmist not only tells us that when we show mercy that we're blessed, but he also reminds us that God delivers us, delivers the merciful during their times of trouble. When we have mercy on others 
and then we run into a bump in the road, somebody will have mercy on us. See, God shows us mercy when we're hurting, when we're in need, or when we've been wrong. God showed us mercy by sending His Son, Jesus Christ, to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. <coughs> and He didn't have to do that. But it was out of His love and His desire to show us mercy that He did just that. And if we are to be Christ-like, which is the definition of the word Christian, then we are to do as Christ did. See, Christ preached and practiced mercy through His healings and blessings of the people who came to Him. Christ did not turn anybody away that needed mercy from Him. And as His people, as His church, we are to do the same for those around us. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 says, Be imitators of God. Therefore, as dearly loved children, to live a life of love, just as Christ loved us, and gave Himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We are to be imitators of God. God has thrown, shown us His mercy through the life, suffering, death, and resurrection of the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And Christ, through His love for us, accepted the task in order to allow us to have access to God's mercy. Christ loved us. And in return, we should love others in the same way. Christ showed mercy to those around Him as followers of Him, as people who call ourselves by His name, we are to do the same thing. We must be willing to have a compassionate, caring, and helpful attitude. Like the Good Samaritan, we need to be willing to show others mercy at any given moment. Those who show mercy are blessed by being shown mercy in our time of need. Next, Jesus talks about the pure in heart. Matthew 5, verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And being pure in heart means to have integrity. Now, the world believes that it's okay to be deceptive. That it's okay for people to use underhanded ways to get what they want. See, the world believes that integrity is good, but it's not a must. All you have to do is turn on the news and watch a story about a corrupt politician or a corrupt member of society that's using other people to get what they want. They may appear to be a good person around to the people around them, but they're using underhanded and deceptive ways to work their way around, work their way through the system. And the world believes that that's okay. As long as you appear to have integrity, doesn't mean you actually have to have integrity. But Christ tells us to be just the opposite. See, we are to be honest and genuine. We are to be morally pure. We are to be sincere. We are to be categorized as people of integrity. We are to be single-minded with a sincere devotion to Jesus Christ. Psalm chapter 51 verse 10 says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. You see, when we ask God to create a pure heart in us, <clears throat> then we also have a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. And as we go through and we finish this series up next week, we're going to see how a lot of these beatitudes intertwine with each other. How you can't have one without having the others. 
See, only God can purify our hearts. We can't do it without Him. However, by reading the Bible, by spending time in prayer, by spending time with fellow believers, and trusting God to help us will allow God to purify our hearts. It will open our hearts to allow Him to do the work that He needs to do to make us who He wants us to be. But we need to be sincere in asking God to purify our hearts. We need to allow Him to change our hearts. We can't say, God, give me a pure heart, but let me still be able to do this. God, give me a pure heart, but I want to still be able to do this. We can't be like that. We have to be sincere. Because when God gives us a pure heart, He gives us a clean conscience. We won't have anything weighing us down. We won't have the guilty feeling when dealing with others because we know that we're honest. Now here is an example of a pure heart. And it's something that's probably happened to all of us at one point or another. You're in line at the grocery store. You check out. You pay with cash. The cashier gives you back your change. And as many of us do, we just stick it in our pockets and go on. Now, working in retail, as long as I worked in retail and, and in the restaurant business, you're supposed to count the change back to the person, to make sure that you have it correct and they have it correct. But a lot of times now, they're, they're in such a hurry because there is a time limit and they get raises or can possibly lose their job by not meeting the time limit. So they're in a hurry, so they just count out the change and hand it to you. You stick it in your pocket. But then after getting home and getting your groceries put away, you empty your pockets and you find that the cashier has given you back too much change. Maybe you paid with a 10 and she gave you back change for a 20. Now, if you have a pure heart, you immediately head back to the store. You return the money, which keeps the cashier out of trouble, because trust me, they will get into trouble. But it also gives you a clean conscience. But if you don't have a pure heart, you pocket the money, you just feel lucky for the day. Yet, you still deep down inside you have that guilty conscience because you know that what you've done in your heart was wrong and you know that somebody else is suffering the consequences for a simple mistake. See, my question to you is which way do you want to feel? See, a pure heart repels all guilt. 1 John chapter 3, verse 3 says, Everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. See, when we accept Christ as our Savior, it should be our desire for God to purify our hearts and purify our lives. A pure heart leads to a pure life. Our hope is in Christ. Because of our desire to be Christ-like, we should desire to have a pure heart. Christ, who was the spotless Lamb of God, never sinned. Yet, because of His love for us, He took our sins. He did this in order to give us the ability to be purified, just as He is pure. With a pure heart, we will have pure and holy thoughts. We will be morally and ethically free from sin. Now, we will not be perfectly pure until Christ returns and calls us home, but we should be striving towards the goal. When we purify our hearts, we're blessed. We're blessed because one day we will be in the very presence of God. But only the pure can stand before Him. As part of the Sermon on the Mount, Christ talked about eight Beatitudes. Last week we looked at three, and today we looked at three more. 
We must hunger and thirst after God's righteousness. We will do this by having a growing desire to deepen our relationship with Jesus Christ. We must be merciful to those in need by being like the Good Samaritan, even if, even if it requires us to sacrifice, just as Christ sacrificed himself for us. We must also desire to have a pure heart, allowing God to work in our lives. We must be honest and sincere in our dealings with others. By having these attitudes and the others that we've talked about last week and we'll talk about next week, we are blessed. So if you think about that for a minute, there are eight beatitudes. There are eight blessings. So for each attitude that we developed, we're blessed with a different blessing. And the final blessing, the greatest blessing, is that one day we will be in the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and our Father in Heaven. So this morning I ask you, what is your attitude like? Do you have a hunger and a thirst for a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you show mercy on those around you who are in need? Do you have a pure heart and a clear conscience? If you don't have one of these attitudes today, there's hope. Confess it before God because God will forgive you. God will change you. If you give Him control over your life, <clears throat> let God give you the hunger and the thirst for righteousness. Let God show you how to be merciful. Ask God to give you a pure heart. Ask God to change your attitude to be like the attitudes that He calls for us to have. If you're sincere in asking God to change your life, He will do just that. But most importantly this morning, none of this matters if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to give you the opportunity this morning to come and accept Him as your Savior. All these attitudes and all these blessings mean nothing without a relationship with Him. Because as a matter of fact, you can't have the attitudes and you can't have the blessings without a relationship with Him. So this morning, if you need prayer or anything, if you have a decision that you'd like to make as we sing our song of invitation, I invite you to come forward, lay it at the foot of the cross this morning, and give it to God.